Hello and uh, welcome everyone to today's event. Um, my name is Nadia Ali and I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University, where I'm also a professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you and welcome today's uh, guest speaker, Walal Kassia, who is going to talk to us on queer feminism with reference to Palestine. And the conversation will draw on Wallah's work with Palestinian queer activist uh, group to discuss the political and conceptual urgency of centering settler colonialism to gender and sexuality issues in the context of Palestine and also the Middle East and North Africa more broadly. And uh, Wallah will also address the recent uprisings and political events in Palestine as a prism to view and understand the context and historical location of Palestinian queer feminist organizing and the decolonial lens they advance. Today's uh, conversation is actually part of a lecture series that um, we are organizing this year at the Center for Middle East Studies. Uh, it is a lecture series on queering the Middle East and its diasporas. And the lecture series is supported by the Herbert H. Goldberger Lectureship Fund and is also co-sponsored by the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. So let me introduce Walal Kassir to you. Walal is an associate researcher at the Middle East Center at the LSE, the London School of Economics and Council for British Research in the Levant. Previously, she worked as an external collaborator at the European University Institute on the Libya Initiative project. She received her PhD in human geography from Durham University in 2018, and her research examines the transformative political potential of everyday activism and aesthetics in the ambit of gender and sexuality in Palestine. Starting in 2022, Wala will be a Marie Curie Fellow at Columbia University, Jafoscari University of Venice, and the London School of Economics, where she will examine the relationship between environmental and gendered politics across multiple contexts of indigeneity. Welcome, Wala. Hello, thank you so Hello. much, Nadia, for this uh, lovely introduction. Thank you for having me tonight and greetings to you and everyone from Palestine. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you're uh, able to join us. I really appreciate, you know, your time and um, and your willingness to, you know, be in conversation uh, with me today. And I should also say that we will have some time for um, questions and comments. So if anyone would like to pose a question or add a comment, please do so through the Q&A function here in the webinar. Okay. Okay, uh, well, uh, let me sort of broader question that, um, you know, looking at your writings and also, you know, I mean, I know what you've been thinking about. I thought I want to link it to some of the issues that um, are currently under debate here at Brown and not just at Brown, of course, uh, everywhere else or in many, many places. But here, I mean, the Center for Middle East Studies is based within the Watson Institute. And um, a couple of years ago, the group of undergraduate students at the Watson Institute, mainly international, but not only, started this initiative of um, decolonizing the curriculum um, in the Watson and in that Brown more broadly. Um, and so knowing that you have been thinking about this uh, quite a bit, um, maybe sort of to start really with a kind of a broad conceptual question, how do you understand decolonization? Thank you so much for this question, Nadia. Um, it's a very important question. Um, my understanding of uh, decolonization in, in broad terms uh, emerges in relation to the kind of uh, positionality, I assume, towards the word, which has also mapped um, itself into the kind of research, collaborative work, and, and thinking uh, that I've been uh, doing to advance an understanding and engagement with it from within the lens of um, gender and sexuality in the context of settler colonial violence in Palestine. 
throughout this journey, my understanding of the process of uh, decolonization, which uh, I believe have come to shape my pedagogic uh, approach, um, encapsulates this uh, idea of quest for home um, for the indigene of the world. And um, it speaks particularly to Palestinian plight for return to their lands, uh, both for refugees uh, who co constitute uh, one of the largest and uh, longest uh, standing unresolved refugee, refugee group in the world today. We must always remember that about one in three refugees worldwide is Palestinian spreading out across uh, UNRWA administered refugee camps inside Palestine and also in uh, neighboring uh, countries. And uh, only today, actually, I was just uh, watching this heartbreaking video on the dire situation of refugees in Lebanon, especially with the beginning of the academic year and lack of services being uh, offered via UNRWA. So there is this obvious need for repatriation that is at the heart of uh, Palestinian struggle. At the same time, and this emanates from my own personal experience of um, growing up inside the occupied I've seen firsthand, you know, the, the violent mechanisms through which uh, native Palestinian dispossession takes place day in, day out. And this is um, not only by virtue of stealing our lands and devaluing our lives, but, you know, uh, also through the processes of um, alienation and distortion uh, onto no native psychic and, 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 and socio-political spheres, which has been crippling uh, our capacity to rise beyond this, uh, you know, settler colonial governmentality machine. So the process of decolonization for me is not only about land retrieval, um, but also simultaneously entwines uh, the struggle to exist in the fullest sense of who we actually are. Um, and that is where pedagogy matters, I believe, to help push, push us all towards uh, home and what that means beyond the structures of, of uh, settler colonial and imperial violence. Um, I always tell my students who sign up for, you know, a program to, to learn about conflict spaces, uh, you know, out there and saving, uh, uh, you know, women in African Middle East uh, region. Uh, that the way you will engage it in my in my classes will force you to think more about where you come from, first and foremost, uh, because conflict out there is a mirror of what's happening here at home and the kind of action and change uh, needed in a so-called uh, you know democratic and peaceful uh, global north north context. So. I think it has been great to see this upsurge in using the framework of decolonization in the academy, and we should all encourage our students uh, to continue to mobilize for this. Um, however, I do approach the mainstreaming of the world within the neoliberal academic sphere with slight skepticism, and sometimes I have this sense of cringiness when I think of how this could just be another example of, uh, you know, intersectionality gone viral in so many problematic ways. Uh, you know, indigenous folks have always told us that decolonization is not a metaphor. And so it is something that we should approach with um, responsibility and, and cautiousness in how it could easily collapse to institutional checklist of having diversified the curriculum without necessarily addressing uh, the transformation of the university into a profit machine, which in itself is rooted in, uh, you know, uh, in past and, and continuous uh, settler colonial and imperial violence. Uh, we know that all, a, lot, a lot of the universities, uh, you know, profit from settler colonial violence in Palestine. And this goes hand in hand with systematic silences of um, academics and scholars who dare to speak uh, truth uh, to power. So I think there's a lot of work and serious thinking that needs to be done um, to take this question of decolonization seriously. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it sort of often reminds me of the way that uh, remember this sort of add women and stir and then also the mainstreaming of gender. I think, you know, there is sort of a similar 
um, dynamic and trend happening with decolonization that, as you say, you know, it becomes first it becomes depoliticized, becomes like a box ticking exercise, you know, oh, just let's just add a few, you know, people of color or non, I mean, in the US, that would be also, you know, maybe non uh, US centric and, but it, but keeping uh, you know everything uh, in terms of you know the the the, the broader methodology and epistemology the same. Um, yeah, yeah I, I I totally uh, agree with that. Um, I mean, in particularly in the UK, there yeah, some universities call for decolonizing the curriculum went hand in hand with the adoption of um, IHRA definition, which is international. A Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working mm -hmm. definition of anti-Semitism, which is Zionist par excellence, mm -hmm. because it entails that any criticism of the state of Israel is a form of anti-Semitism. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, as yes, you rightly point out, because um, in the neoliberal uh, market economy, um, university administrators have, of course, understood, uh, you know, that there uh, is a market out there for decolonization and so um, that is yeah that is a problem I, I, I get that uh, let me sort of shift a bit and also kind of sort of broader question before we getting into the more specifics of your work and that's um, you know links to queer theory um, queer theory which of course has is quite broad and it has developed tremendously over the last years and it also seems to mean slightly different things to different people. Um, now, aside from, of course, important contributions of queer of color scholars and the queer of color critique, which still often is quite Eurocentric or US centric, um, more specifically in relation to the Middle East, I mean, queer scholars working on or from the Middle East have really expanded our understandings of what a queer lens might mean. And, um, you know, that there's really been quite a shift. Now, I'm, from what I understand, looking at the sort of shift, I see that, you know, while still being, of course, interested in challenging, um, you know, the gender binaries and challenging heteronormativity and engaging with sexuality, um, that a queer lens is a wider methodological and analytical lens to look at all kinds of uh, trends and phenomena. I mean, sort of, I guess, similar to a feminist lens in that sense. Um, so what is your take on queer theory? Um, engagement with uh, queer theory is, um, is inspired by and builds on the legacy of, of women of color activism and theorizing of coalitional politics, uh, which uh, transcends uh, you know, what, what Gloria Anzaldúa has famously uh, described uh, as the model of Western dualism. Um, in this sense, uh, queering as a method of analysis uh, speaks to and, and, and resonates with a lot of the thinking that, you know, post and decolonial theory has advanced. Um, in, in the special issue on queering the Middle East, uh, I contemplate those necessary intersections between uh, you know, uh, the two fields and, and the productive ways in which queering as, as a deconstructive critique uh, brings about um, a challenge to uh, the field's uh, you know, normative uh, assumptions, including you know, the very hailing or use of, of the term Middle East. Um, in my own teaching uh, on gender and conflict, I try to kind of push my students to utilize a queer lens uh, in relation to a global South critique uh, that then becomes um, uh, a site for contesting even the predominance of queer itself, uh, you know, both in theoretical and, and policy realms, uh, which um, often winds up reproducing, you know, hegemonic notions uh, such as peace and security for the girls and gays in conflict areas. And this is, you know, where we can see the traveling of theory in ways that capture um, uh, what uh, Shamira Migani and Umaira Said called uh, the unacknowledged assumptions of white Eurocentric or North American identity uh, that tend to travel with queer theory and define the non-normative in, in pre-codified imperialistic terms. 
Um, you know, now if we turn to the work and legacy of indigenized and, and racialized subjects, we see an articulation of a radical queer critique that um, predates the official, you know, storyline of where queerness is said to have begun and is often charted as a canon uh, or a, as a mode of, of, of political praxis uh, that is linked to uh, the location of white Anglo-American subjects or, or those whom uh, Jose Esteban Munoz described, uh, uh, you know, uh, those who are loaded with the proof of citizenship. Uh, in, in his uh, text where he charts queerness as a theory of disidentifications uh, that unapologetically derives uh, from women of color, everyday lives and day-to-day and -day -to -day practices of living and encountering racism, homophobia uh, within structures of capitalism and colonialism. In, in my own work, I, I closely engage, you know, what, what I call a Palestinian grounded knowledge of queerness, which not only challenge the, 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 you know, the need to necessarily fit the interpretive or machinery of Western, including the, you know, um, critical and leftist theory frameworks, but also is instructive of uh, the day-to-day -day praxis of decolonization that weaves uh, the intimate into the geopolitical. Yeah, yes, and um, clearly we need to get back to some of that substance. Uh, but before I do that, um, I um, again sort of like I guess a little bit of context and also you know my personal interest. Um, I've been aware of the tensions between I guess what one could call the kind of more traditional feminists. Um, as well as liberal rights based LGBT activists and queer feminists in the Middle East. Um, and it's sort of, I think that, I think starts to open up, um, you know, uh, I mean, this question or this um, interest of mine starts to open up, uh, you know, a space to actually talk about the sort of grounded, uh, ethnographically grounded understandings of, you know, queer and also, you know, developing uh, queer theory from within the Middle East. So looking at these tensions between, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so more traditional feminists, liberal rights based LGBT activists and queer feminists in the Middle East. Can you speak to these tensions, um, particularly in relation to Palestine, but maybe also more broadly um, in the region? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I believe that one of the main points of disagreements and, uh, you know, uh, contentions, especially in the context of Palestine at this moment, is the ways in which we conceptualize the existence of the Zionist entity and its organic and, and historical linkages to wider geopolitical structures, which affect our feminist and queer political praxis. Um, now, with the signing of the Oslo Agreement, we have seen the rise of feminist democrats who became part of the injuized feminist movement, working under the Palestinian Authority apparatus, which, as has become very clear, uh, particularly from the recent events that happened in Palestine, you know, the May uprising and the subsequent confrontation with the, with the PA. In sorry, the sorry to interrupt, Wala, but um, maybe not everyone is aware of those. So can you say a little bit about the uprisings, the recent ones? Yeah. So um, in May of this summer, we had, um, you know, a popular movement of, of dissent that spread out across of the whole of Palestine. And for me and for many other Palestinians, it marked uh, a beginning of a new Palestinian awakening in the ways in which, uh, you know, everyone took to the streets, uh, you know, to to counter uh, the, uh, you know, Zionist movement of uh, depopul depopulating Palestinian um, uh, um, neighborhoods and uh, what particularly was triggered by what happened in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, an East Jerusalemite neighborhood um, that, you know, Israel has been systematically working on emptying it out uh, of all of the Palestinian families who live there. And this has instigated a movement, uh, you know, uh, of popular uh, dissent and uh, Palestinians everywhere. Uh, as we say, you know, from the river to the sea, uh, uh, they, they, they took to the streets and, uh, you know, um, 
and started, you know, resisting this, uh, you know, um, and standing with also uh, chanting for solidarity also with what's happening um, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. And then after that, uh, also another wave of, of, of heightened violence was, uh, you know, um, it was launched uh, against uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. And we've seen also another wave of bombardment and, and uh, brutal violence. Uh, and, you know, and this was, was, I think, the beginning for something that continues to unfold up to this moment, um, especially in the way it's, uh, you know, it, it, it shows um, um, the, the kind of, uh, and we called it the Intifada of Unity, um, in the ways in which Palestinians came out uh, from all of these fragmented present cells that, you know, the, the, the Zionist entity has relegated us to these little Bantustans, uh, completely uh, disintegrated and separated from one another. And we've seen a kind of a, a new, you know, this uh, spirit of, of unity that echoed across the whole of Palestine, including 48. And th there is this, you know, also clarity in relation to what is this struggle about? You know, this is about settler colonialism and in and, and native disposition of, of their uh, homeland, which I believe also builds on the legacy of what uh, queer and feminist movements have been doing uh, for the past for the past 20 years or so uh, and we can talk about this also um, in, in a bit Nadia if you wish oh. yeah yeah so uh, thank you for clarifying that and maybe sort of now going back to the question because I interrupted you <laughs> yeah so in terms of the tensions uh, if you could sort of follow up on that um, so I, as I was saying, you know, with Oslo, we've seen this kind of injuized, uh, you know, the woman movement, which had a popular base, which we've all seen during the first Intifada uh, in the late 80s, and with the signing of the, you know, the peace accords agreements, uh, um, we've seen a shift of that woman movement, and it has been kind of um, contained within NGO frameworks. Um, and um, this part, this uprising, and you know what happened then also with. Um, in relation to the PA uh, violence uh, in the aftermath of uh, killing of a, uh, a political opponent um, uh, from Hebron, and then Palestinians also took to the streets again to now voice, uh, you know, um, uh, their protest in, in relation to the, the new structure, you know, internal structure that governs them, the, the, the PA and um, this kind of Oslo umbrella, um, which, um, you know, this, it's an induced apparatus. This this um, um, this apparatus is one that serves and normalizes the settler colonial regime. And within that moment of confrontation, we've seen um, an accentuation of these tensions between women who have been employed to serve and work for the security apparatus, uh, whose gender programming has been heavily funded by European and American powers. Um, and and you know these were the same women now violently attacking, uh, uh, you know, um, the groups of women, uh, political and queer activists on, on the streets. Um, now, you know, the, the Oslo Peace Agreement moment was this context where, as I said, uh, a lot of civil society organizing turns to um, collaborative projects with Israelis. And that is something uh, I talk about in one of my articles, tracing the history of a group like uh, Al Qaus uh, for sexual and gender diversity in Palestine, where uh, this group emerges under the umbrella of working, uh, you know, within um, uh, with uh, Israelis, uh, right, within this liberal rights LGBT uh, based uh, kind of. Um, um, sphere. So it is interesting also to think about the tensions and the transformations that one group has undergone in and of itself. Uh, the turn to this feminist and queer political lens that the group then embraces doesn't happen overnight, but sits within the historical processes underlining the continuity of our Nakba. Uh, you know, Palestinian catastrophe is not just that one moment relegated to the you know establishment of Israel in 1948, but yeah, it's uh, you know continues and 
um, through the very um, subject positions and, and embodied reality of living under settler colonial occupation, and now the neo-colonial entity serving the occupier. And so, you know, it's like a, a process of decolonizing from within, so to speak, that al qaus's uh, queer feminist lens encapsulates when it refuses to partner with Israelis or to receive funding from international donors who do not uphold uh, a boycott uh, stance. Um, now, some groups who are on the more liberal rights-based approach have branded this political stance as Puritan or unnecessarily hyper-political, hyper uh, whilst uh, traditional leftists have seen them as part of the gay international agenda. But I think if we are really keen, as it seems to discuss decolonization, then uh, the work and, and analysis of such a group needs to be taken seriously into account. Um, perhaps taking this experience as a productive example, which can move us beyond the binarism of Puritan and, and collaborator. Yeah, I think it's a um, really important point the, in terms of you know, the, the significance of temporality I mean, I've seen that um, in different contexts, especially, you know, looking at um, Iraq and, uh, you know, working with feminist organizations um, and, you know, looking at the relationship between feminism and nationalism that, you know, at different, different um, political historical moments, you know, the politics shift and it is a process, as you say. And I think we often tend to, um, try to reify or you know kind of you know essentialize a sort of politics uh, while of course we know that everywhere in the world I mean people do shift uh, positions in line with also either sometimes changing realities but another times it's just sort of layers of experiencing a given reality um, so uh, yeah thanks for that and you know I think we should maybe talk a bit later about uh, al Kaos in more detail but um I was wondering now when you were speaking about, you know, feminist activism in Palestine, I'm, I'm aware that in recent year, there has been an um, independent feminist movement that's sort of different from, uh, you know, the, the feminists that are part of the kind of gender mainstreaming apparatus. Um, and that's um, called Talat. And it, um, it has broken out of some of the older frameworks of feminist activism in, in Palestine. So what is it that distinguishes Talad from previous feminist mobilization? Yeah. Um, as uh, you know, it, today marks the 21st anniversary of the Second Intifada. Um, and with the Second Intifada, there was, you know, I think it was this moment where there was a clear realization um, for a lot of women on the ground um, that, you know, that the liberal peace paradigm does not work and it only serves the economic interests of a certain class that is benefiting from this, uh, you know, uh, political structure. And I think uh, this gap continued to accentuate with time. And, you know, through the, you know, the, the growing contradictions within the Oslo uh, status quo, um, on the one hand, there was this facade of progress for women's rights through the issuance of um, presidential decrees, uh, uh, you know, affirming Palestinian national authorities support of international treaties, such as the 1325 uh, resolution, acknowledging full and equal participation of women in all efforts of maintaining and enhancing peace and security. And then in April 2014, there was the signing and, and ratification of CEDAW in line with the prov provision of Palestinian basic law. And so it became clear to a lot of uh, you know, I think feminists, including those in Talaat, I think that the way in which uh, the PA is, is utilizing the women card to only rally itself internationally, and, and within the eyes of donor states um, as a legible representative and, and a state maker, whilst in reality, uh, uh, you know, violence against women continued unabated. And so there was this gap between the institutional theoretical claim for equality and women's rights and the practical and real demands that defined uh, the continuity of women's struggle on, on the ground. And, you know, this is not only 
pertaining to the context of the West Bank or Gaza, you know, which reifies this whole Oslo and, and 67 boundary. Um, uh, but, you know, also to Palestinian women in Israel uh, proper, uh, where violence against women in, in that context happens because of that direct interaction with colonial institutional structures. And this is another thing we've seen and also in, in the recent uprising, you know, Israeli police apparatus has had its role to play in the wider spread of criminality within Arab communities and a specific targeting of women's bodies and lives, uh, you know, as a site of violence. So I think Talat was born out of that need to mobilize on a grassroots level uh, bringing women from the margins to mobilize beyond this that institutional framework, uh, but also revealing and challenging also that you know the heteropatriarchy as it runs through those wider institutions from the PA to Israel to the smaller organizational, factional, and NGO units uh, where sexual and gender violence uh, persists. Um, reaching obviously to the violence at the level of the home uh, and the house and the family relations. Uh, and so if we remember Talat, um, the Talat movement started in the aftermath of the brutal mur murdering of uh, Isra Gharayyab uh, at the hand of um, a family member. Um, and they issued then that need to step out uh, into the street as the word Talat in Arabic uh, captures. Um, and they chanted for uh, no free homeland, that was their slogan, no free homeland without free women. Um, and this, you know, and this is what distinguishes Talat in that that call for freedom did not confine its space uh, itself to the spaces, um, uh, you know, uh, to which the colonizer and, and, you know, the Oslo structure has relegated us, but it happened across the totality of Palestine, but also uh, in the diaspora and in other spaces where Palestinian uh, women uh, are. Um, and so, um, and, and up to now, I think it is not uh, surprising to see also coalitional work happening and growing between uh, uh, groups like Al Qaus and Talat, given the kind of um, feminist queer lens that the, both groups uh, ha uh, have. So yeah. I think, yeah, in a nutshell, we're seeing a progress towards the yeah. feminist agenda that wants to bring something uh, different. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So uh, I wanted to ask the question about al Qaus, but um, I've just seen that there are two questions from audience members that are kind of linked to what you're just saying. So I'm, I'm going to ask them, and so maybe you can elaborate, and then uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about al Qaus. So the first question is by Aboud uh, Ashab, uh, who's asking, what is the role of the PA in terms of women's rights, given its support to the CEDO agreement, yet shutting down Al Qawas locations in Ramallah. And uh, the second question is by Mark Meft. Um, the number of honor killings is high in Palestine. Do you feel like it's addressed enough within the Palestinian civil society? Do you feel like the legitimate struggle against colonialism can sometimes refrain or slow down these conversations about sexist violence within the Palestinian community. And uh, so much love from Algeria. So if you could answer these two, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for these questions. Uh, I think the first one, I kind of partially already answered it in the fact that um, there is this kind of gap between what we're seeing in terms of uh, the PA having signed on many international agreements uh, and uh, some of them pertain to women's rights and gender equality, uh, but, uh, you know, um, and, and that's, this is exactly what prompted Talat to kind of uh, to do that movement with from you know uh, against and kind of outside that kind of institutional framework because it just becomes a way uh, for them to to rally for legitimacy internationally whilst uh, you know locally um, not much has happened uh, to kind of um, mark any progress in terms of uh, women's rights and and gender equality on the contrary violence is um, is rising and uh, I think that's part of the the whole structure of violence under which, and also the many contradictions, you know, we have a, 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 a 
uh, you know, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the PA, he's lost legitimacy. <laughs> I don't know if I've lost count of the years and we continue to see these uh, presidential decrees uh, coming out. So the very fact that we have a presidential decree in support of women's rights is for me problematic of, of the very structure, you know, under which uh, the, the PA has put itself. And, um, and so it is hardly surprising when, the, when we see, um, you know, upsurge of violence in relation to groups and their work like, uh, like Al Qaus. Um, it in fact links um, to the ways in which uh, the PA uh, uses ideas in relation to civil peace and morality to justify its presence and you know legitimacy within the popular uh, masses. Uh, so, and that's what happened with Al Qaus's incident in in terms of one of their activities um, that was banned, and then there was a whole kind of debate around that uh, and um, a statement that was issued by the PA uh, police uh, to ban them. Uh, uh, whilst actually the presence of Al Qaus um, is uh, um, in line with Palestinian law, and I think this is where Al Qaus kind of smartly navigated itself and used um, its uh, connections with the civil society base to kind of uh, challenge uh, the PA statement. Um, and uh, uh, you know the fact that this is uh, not in line with Palestinian law, and in fact, this statement then was pulled out; it was withdrawn. Uh, but obviously, there was a clear uh, kind of uh, um, uh, attack on the group, um, and um, which up to now is not helpful in terms of uh, even reporting uh, in relation to Al Qaus's uh, activities and all, or people who are being suspected as, as related to them. Um, and I don't see you know, these struggles as uh, disconnected from the wider Palestinian struggle vis-a-vis -vis the PA uh, apparatus. I think they are all connected. The second question I'd forgotten, um, Nadia, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> No, no, uh, it is a lot. So on the killings, yes. Yeah. So um, do you feel like the legitimate struggle against colonialism can sometimes refrain or slow down conversations about sexist violence within the Palestinian community? Yeah, I, I think here we go back to a similar question in, uh, that and kind of uh, um, the, the debates that Al Qaus's positionality has triggered. And I've just uh, mentioned that in terms of, you know, why are you discussing politics so much when we need to be focusing on, on homophobia and kind of fighting uh, internally homophobia within Palestinian society. But again, I think the experiences, um, uh, you know, that women and queer uh, subjects in Palestine have undergone shows that the two are actually interconnected and uh, you know uh, the violence that uh, uh, that is exercised even in relation to the ways in which we internalize homophobia within our own communities links to the violence of the settler colonial machine and the ways in which it worked on that uh, psychic and sociopolitical sphere, as I said, on disintegrating us and also um, um, on, a, you know, disabling any kind of way to have these needed conversations within our uh, communities um, and I, I, I disagree with that. I don't think that, you know, uh, the, the phenomena of, of any gender-based violence or, uh, you know, uh, homophobia-related violence should be discussed um, in ways that dissolve the political question because our own experiences say that we cannot put politics aside. The two are, you know, uh, interconnected. I can just interject here, um, Ola. I mean, of course, I agree with you, um, you know, and I mean, I would not challenge you on many of that. This is, you know, you're much more closely linked to that. But I mean, I do think that it's one thing to say the, you know, they're they're closely interlinked and we cannot, it, it's a wrong binary. But I think what there is a risk, and I think that has happened in the past in the Palestinian context and sometimes happens now, is that because, because of the omnipresence of the occupation and because of the you know the i mean the stark and uh, it seems like ever worsening situation i think there is a risk to um well to not address you know violence that emanates from within the community and although 
I agree that it's important to not culturalize, you know, Palestinian as, you know, any kind of Middle Eastern context. I mean, you know, these are, I mean, there are conditions linked to political economy and conflict in which, you know, certain we know that there's a link between the militarization of society and gender based violence. But I have to say, I felt quite moved and inspired by, the, you know, the Kurdish women I talked to, I mean, Kurdish women in Turkey who clearly were struggling with the Turkish state, um, but, you know, who would tell me, you know, we are as much um, suffering at the hands of the Turkish state as we are having problems with our Kurdish comrades, right? And so they were sort of speaking about the, you know, the patriarchal sexist attitudes within the political movement. And um, so, I mean, I think that that is, of course, not, it's also happening in Palestine, but I think there is sometimes, I feel a sort of, you know, and for good reasons, but, um, you know, a kind of tendency to not address that, certainly not address that vis-a-vis -vis and outside, because then obviously that becomes quite problematic uh, politically. Yeah, I mean, addressing one doesn't mean doing away with the other. So yeah. maybe also distill this kind of binarism of talking within my community, then it means I, I you know, I am not going to work on the issue of the occupation because mm. one thing leads to the other and the, yes. the two are entwined. And mm. when we talk about, you know, honor killing, in what way do we view feminists? I mean, the, the it's, I mean, we've had a woman who's, who was killed yesterday in cold blood in Jerusalem, a mother mm -hmm. of four uh, by Israeli occupation forces. We, you know, th there isn't a day that comes by without hearing, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, some stories, you know, uh, and uh, in the news about um, family killing, but also uh, at the hands of the occupation. So I think we can't, you know, just look at one and kind of ignore the other. And especially the fact that um, um, given especially the history of Palestinian women's struggle in terms of at the checkpoint and the targeting, especially also of uh, pregnant women bodies, uh, a, a lot of which Palestinian feminism has written about and documented. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think we can tackle one without the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I certainly agree with that. Um, maybe uh, now it's a good time to tell us a little bit more about al Qaus because not everyone in the audience, I mean, you've already spoken quite a bit about it, but if you sort of can tell us a little bit more about uh, the organization and, um, you know, the kind of shift in terms of its vision uh, for queer liberation in Palestine. And also maybe tell us a bit about your, collaboration with, with al Qaus because I think that's also interesting. Yeah, so um, al Qaus for Sexual and Gender Diversity in Palestinian Society is uh, a queer feminist organization that works on uh, building communities around Palestine to promote social change uh, on the basis of gender and sexuality related issues. Uh, they work on as a grassroots movement on different initiatives while uh, you know engaging civil society organizations to kind of deepen an understanding of the dimension of sexuality, uh, which is quite often absented within the local uh, Palestinian context. Um, they, they started off in 2001, um, as I said, but then they've grown into uh, as a political organization working on uh, expanding the analysis on the intersections between sexuality, patriarchy and settler colonialism. So they utilize this political framework that challenges, uh, you know, single issue uh, LGBT uh, approach to sexuality and um, I think what you know distinguishes Al Qaus, and that's something that kind of daunted on me in in one of uh, its workshop spaces recently, is uh, the value of. Um, creating alternative spaces uh, for critical thinking and, and fostering healing uh, and self-love uh, beyond, uh, you know, the, the modes of socializations that in Bill Hook's terms, uh, perpetuate domination. So a lot of al Qaus's work focuses on providing psychosocial support within um, a liberation psychology framework. Uh, for example, they've recently conducted uh, collaborative research with a plethora of uh, counselors. 
social workers and, and field participants about um, Palestinian families' interactions with their children's diverse gendered and sexual experiences. And here we go again to the question of politics and talking to the community. And this is, you know, uh, a lot of Al-Qaus's production is in Arabic and also with, you know, all of these um, uh, civil society forces that exist in Palestine trying to work within um, you know, our communities to widen that discussion uh, uh, around sexuality. Um, some of the findings of this work, which has been uh, uh, both published in, on, it, on their website and also discussed deeply in seminar sessions, uh, bring out vital reflections in relation to the role of the psyche of the oppressed in, in accentuating homophobic violence within our own communities. And, and also, you know, in a way, creating these preconceived judgments within queer Palestinian subjects, where there is this uh, internalized notion of my family will reject me and there is no space for me within my own community. So how can we work on kind of distilling that notion, but by also working with our own uh, communities and families? Um, um, if, so um, through this research and many other initiatives um, that al uh, you know, uh, assumes um, uh, or al uh, uh, you know, works on, they, I think, um, uh, you know, they occupy this activist educator role who is initiating, as I said, that deep and, and much needed dialogue uh, within ourselves and our communities um, to demand and articulate um, other ways of being and, and belonging to Palestine. Um, and they've published recently this online resource document in which it art articulates, uh, you know, clearly how queer liberation is pa in Palestine is fundamentally rooted in Palestinian dream uh, for liberation and, and self-determination. Um, so this vision for, you know, queer liberation in Palestine, in my view, um, captures this idea of uh, decolonizing uh, the space of the home from within, uh, where one's um, return to oneself is, you know, embeds a return to the family, the homeland, and Palestine as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that you've also been <clears throat> working with al to um, on issues of pink washing and pink watching. Uh, maybe I can uh, follow up on that. But before doing this, I'd like to share another audience question. Um, one of our graduate stu students, Maris, hello, Maris, uh, Maris Kaleda, who's saying, thank you for the very insightful talk. I would like to know more about your strategies of keeping your methodology grounded in Palestinian realities without risking that these critical issues and theorization get isolated in their particularities. In other words, they get viewed as exceptional, thus again reproducing the global hierarchies of north, south, center, periphery, etc. Also, and there's another question attached here: uh, How do you make the distinction between coalitional work and intersectional work? Mm. Um, I think the coalitional and intersectional, they're connected. I don't think I, I necessarily see much of a uh, gap between the two. And it also echoes the ways in which uh, kind of intersectionality emanates uh, from the praxis of coalitional politics, uh, uh, from that day-to-day, -day, you know, confrontation and, and uh, with violence uh, on many scales, um, which then uh, also brings out, and I think that's, that's something that also were, uh, connects to the kind of thinking where I am at right now in relation to the violence of pinkwashing, and we might come to talk about this in a bit, um, kind of connecting it to also um, other layers and other dimensions, um, which also then poses the question in relation to solidarity and the kind of solidarity uh, we are seeking. Uh, so I think of pinkwashing not just in the kind of uh, sexual kind of sphere, but also as it connects with other forms of washings, such 
such as greenwashing or redwashing, and we can talk about this uh, uh, in a bit. So all of these issues intersect and also come to kind of um, uh, expand a vision of our politics that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, that brings all of these coalitions uh, together. Uh, in terms of uh, the first question, I'm not sure I exactly understood what it means in terms of the specificity and uh, kind of uh, drawing out similarities, but from my 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 personal experience of working with uh, with uh, a group like Al Qaus, there is always the you know uh, linkages and connections that they are being made, uh, and I think the two questions kind of connect here as well. Well, I think the way that I understand the question is you know the way that. So I guess, for instance, I mean, in terms of queer theorizing, you have the sort of queer theory that emanates a lot from US academia or, you know, British academia. And then, um, so any kind of empirical context linked to the Middle East is kind of more considered as data that is then sort yeah. of explaining the existing framework. And I, the way that I understand Marie's question is, so, you know, how do we kind of, how do you avoid this um, conundrum of, you know, focusing in on a particular uh, without it then being constructed as, well, this is an exceptional and that does not then feed back into actually wider theorizing. You, but I it's, think not, that's, yeah. it's also of how we view theory and where we invest ourselves mostly. Do we invest in, as I said, uh, queerness as has often collapsed as a canon within that certain Anglo-American kind of base, or do we look for other sites also for queerness? And there are so many others, I think, you know, within Global South, but also Global North, you know, Indigenous take on queer theory for me has been so inspiring. And I've built on that because I've seen so much in terms of the connection, uh, with the, you know, th in relation to theory, which emanates also from that particular situatedness vis-a-vis -vis that structure of violence called uh, settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, it is something that we are struggling with. No, I mean, I feel not just in relation to queer theory, but more broadly in terms of Middle East studies, there is often this sort of exceptionalizing going on. And um, I think it's sort of, I, I feel people working in Latin America um, or from within Latin America seem to be more successful in a way to sort of shape, you know, mm -hmm. a wider thinking, but it's re really quite, still quite, um, I mean, I think, things are changing slowly but it is still a big challenge yeah i think it is and also it's uh how much do, are we gonna be gutty um, as middle east scholars <laughs> wearing that hat mm. to go back to uh, our own intellectual base as well you know and uh uh samir amir was one of the first people who talked about delinking and then Latin American theorists kind of uh, built on that to theorize decol decolonial. And so I see all of these intersections as well uh, in the way we have to also reconcile with our own kind of intellectual yes. uh, base. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we're sort of slowly starting to run out of time. So I definitely want to I want to give you a chance to speak in a bit more depth about the issue of pink washing and pink watching and how you approach it. And uh, I guess you and also jointly with our cows. Yeah, so um, yeah, we've done a piece for a decolonizing sexuality network book, which is a kind of activist, more activist kind of, uh, um, and I hate this binary activist versus theory. Uh, it's problematic in so many ways. So, um, uh, we've wrote this kind of collaborative piece where I was invited to kind of join Raith Hilal and Hanin Maiki in the reflection on, on uh, you know, uh, the image of the Palestinian homosexual and also uh, tackling also pinkwashing. And I think this is where we can also address some of the methodological um, concerns of what I call decolonial queering in that, you know, uh, how much it, it has this kind of participatory action um, framework which doesn't necessarily mean us as, as scholars imposing ourselves to create this equality paradigm with our um, participants but also being humble enough to be actually invited by them I've been invited by my own you know by um, uh, uh, friends and and um, 
uh, you know, uh, in Al Qaus um, and people I worked with in Al Qaus to to co-author this piece for the Decolonizing Sexuality Network and also for the Journal of Palestine uh, Studies. So it, it was upon their request, actually. Um, so in terms of pinkwashing, uh, Al Qaus's emergence uh, as an independent collective coincides with the Zionist uh, practice of uh, branding itself as a you know, modern progressive society and, and gay haven. And this tactic can be traced back to 2002 when Israel recruited its uh, Jewish LGBT community and also relied on other in institutional bases such as the ministry of foreign affairs to help uh, promote itself using um, so-called pink uh, progressive and LGBT friendly tropes. And this uh, goes hand in hand with the expansion of Zionist settler colonial and oppressive policies against Palestinians whom are now being depicted as, as homophobic. Now, um, an initial reading of what I've just said might tell us that this is simply a propaganda machine that the Zionist entity is using to rally and rebrand its image worldwide. And, you know, a practice of self-promotion that many states uh, might be justifiably, you know, utilizing for international legitimacy. However, and this is where I think a lot of the literature on pinkwashing misses the point, the fundamental issue with pinkwashing um, and that relates to how we understand uh, anti-pinkwashing work uh, or pinkwatching and, and mobilizing against it. Um, it links to the ways in which uh, it functions as a mechanism of settler colonial violence, which happens on multiple scales. The first and most obvious one relates to the hegemony of a uh, global gay liberatory agenda that claims to be divorced of any political stance, and that is not only situated in predominant global north uh, mechanisms of LGBT organizing, but also links and interacts with uh, geopolitical questions such as international politics of aid or uh, you know, politics of recognition for Israel. Um, um, countries in Europe in the USA um, uh, have this agenda, but also others, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, such as India in the global south utilize this pinkwashing narrative to allow and, and, and generate their own politics of racism, whilst allowing, you know, that global expansion uh, of Israel uh, sexually and militarily. In, in such a way, we arrive to the second element underlining the dangers of pinkwashing, and this links to the idea of naturalizing and conquest and producing settler subjects, not only as natural citizens of a legible state, but also as advocates of, for freedom, diversity, and progressive values. Um, I mean, to give you a concrete example, um, we can think of 2018 moment of uh, Eurovision contest uh, context, where uh, Neta Brizalai, um, uh, the, the winner at the time, uh, describes her winning, um, you know, the, the fact that she won, it happened because we believe in the value of diversity that her currently Israel represents. And then she gave, you know, flagged this invite for the audience and the contest to uh, her hometown in Jerusalem, saying next year in Jerusalem. And this happens exactly, this incident happened on the day of the state's official commemoration of what it calls Yom Yerushalayim, uh, uh, which in Israel is a celebration of what they call the reunification of, of the city, uh, meaning for Palestine, the violent conquest of East Jerusalem in 1967. And so this naturalizing of settler conquest then links to, um, I think, the third and most crucial layer through which pinkwashing functions, which is about the violence and pain that Palestinians and, and Palestinian queer subjects in particular uh, have to endure as a result of them being conceived, uh, uh, you know, as only within this framework of oppression and, and, and victimhood. So um, pinkwashing tells queer Palestinians that you don't have a place within your community because your only savior is the colonial space, uh, institutions, uh, and, and, and all subjects actually who exhibit this facade of solidarity with queer Palestinians. Um, and that's where the value of pink watching uh, work is, lies in that it confronts this fantasy of colonial savior narrative, you know, saying that this uh, refugee making machine cannot be uh, a space for refuge. 
uh, for Palestinians. And it does that, um, as I argue, from a place that uh, troubles more than represents uh, you know, uh, the logic of identification and identity politics upon which Israel uh, constructs its gay other. Yeah. Well, well, I have to say, you know, I could continue um, being in conversation with you and we have also more audience questions, but unfortunately um, the time is up, so we'll have to actually stop our conversation here. But uh, thanks so much. Um, it's really interesting, very inspiring, uh, very important work. Um, and yes, I'm looking forward to, you know, hearing and um, reading more from you. Uh, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for participating and for their questions. And sorry um, that we couldn't address all of them. Uh, we'll be recording and making the event. Uh, we've recorded the event and we make it available so you can share it um, later on. Yeah, so thanks so much, Wala. And um, yeah, well, I, I, uh, I'm very, uh, I feel very humbled and inspired by the work that you're doing and um, wish you best of luck and uh, yeah, hope to connect with you soon again. Thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you. It was a pleasure.